Hello there and welcome to Cinema Claxica. We are part of the Geek Show Podcast Network. In particular, we are the Geek Show's dedicated films podcast. I'm Graham and this week I've been joined by Rob. Hello. And Sarah. Hello. And to start off with, we've got a question of the week, uh, which we normally we tend to theme around <laughs> our current film of the week, uh, which this week is Victor Sjöström's The Phantom Carriage, uh, which I, I think I, is Star Wars Episode 1, is that what it is? <laughs> Did you, um, <laughs> do you just know how to pronounce that, or have you been practising that in front of the mirror like you did with We Recifical? <laughs> Um. I, I like Scandinavian vowels. They're just great. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Who's that film composer, Hilda Stottir? Oh yeah, oh, who yeah. did uh, the Joker? Who yeah. she should never be remembered for because it's an awful movie, isn't it? It's awful. <laughs> <laughs> but she did some good stuff as well. Oh, the music's the only good part of that. Well, and yeah. uh, the acting from the man who's good at that mm. acting. <laughs> you know I like the man who's good at acting. Yeah, you see, I'm not offending anybody there because you know everybody's <laughs> under the thick swipes of that brush. Yeah, you could be talking about Mark Maron. You're not, no. but you could be. <laughs> Definitely not. Blimey. <laughs> um, but yes, the. We we decided not to spend ages wrestling with uh, you know, what's your favourite Swedish movie featuring the Grim Reaper or something like that. Populous category though it is. Uh, we went with something completely random. Our question of the week is, invent a new Oscar category and who do you think should win? So from Facebook, uh, Mikey Toes says, best dance choreography Oscar. In the light of no new releases, the winner is from now on from the greatest showman. Uh, elsewhere, Mick Snowden says best actor not called Daniel Day Lewis, which would of course be awarded to Daniel Day Lewis. <laughs> and Matt Culver invents a sort of Oscarception with his answer best Oscar bait film. Which is just genuinely be best like picture. I mean, prior to about three mm. years ago, that's just best picture. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I would quite like it if there was a award for like best Oscar bait picture that we haven't nominated, just so everyone could go, "Oh God, yeah, that was supposed to be in contention, wasn't it?" I mean, this year it could have been Cats. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> what was it? it? Was Moonlight where people went, "Hang on, hang on, hang on," what are the Oscars doing nominating and? <laughs> Awarding good food movies here, some things. Yes. This is why we've got all the bad stuff that's happening in the world, because the Oscars <laughs> decided to award films that are deserving. Maybe, yeah, <laughs> something's got to balance it out. Yes. Uh, on Twitter, Ashley Lane suggests another one that I think could just be an Oscar ceremony prior to about five years ago. Uh, the we got that one wrong category where a film or filmmaker that should have won an Oscar didn't. Oh yeah, so mm. many potential winners of that though, isn't there? See, previously they just used to wait and award someone for a film that didn't deserve it. Yeah, what was Green? Well, no, it wasn't Green Room. That's totally off base. Green Book, wasn't it? That was uh, yes, was... very different film. Green Room, I think. It'd be an interesting <laughs> double bill, you know. <laughs> Keep it a lively evening. All right, so Don Shirley can win over one racist in the front of his car, but what about a crowd of racists <laughs> in a gig? I mean, it, if only all it took, if all it took to win racist over was to sing Natty Punk's "F Off," I think it'd just be so easy. It, it's good for them, and it's good for us. Yeah. Um, my answer is a real one because I thought this. For a, a, a while, I'm not going to like, fabricate some joke answer because that's mm. too much hard work. But I genuinely, <laughs> honestly believe there should be a child actor award. Yes! Because for two, every time there's like, I don't know, Covenzine Wallace or I can't remember the name mm. of the kid from Room, um, it was like, it's just a cute novelty. 
give those kids the, mm. the, the respect they deserve. They are some great actors in these movies. Kid actors are not what they used to be. They deserve recognition, just like any other age spectrum actor. Yeah. And to put them... I think it was that Ecclesia Wallace was in a move in the bracket as the oldest nominee. I think it was for Michael Haneke's uh, Amua. And yes, that's yeah, like, that's just you, you pandering and you're trying to. Oh, isn't it cute? Look at the cute little actor yeah. who's nominated. No, give them the juice. <laughs> give them an award. They deserve it. I think the the thing that justifies that decision for me is: Do you remember when True Grit came out? And Healy Stenfield is just astonishingly good in that role. Oh, yes. Mm. And and she got a nomination, yes, but for Best Supporting Actress. That's the level you can get to if you're a child actor. You can carry a Coen Brothers film against Matt Damon, Jeff Bridges and Josh Brolin. And we'll give you a supporting award for a lead performance. And she didn't even win. Absolute rubbish. It still makes me angry. Yeah, give them their own. <laughs> give them the Jews. I think it's long overdue. Mm. Long, long overdue. Yeah. Mm. My Sorry for being serious. Be... Sorry for being a serious <laughs> one. <Danny. laughs> no, go. I think we can handle both serious and comedic. Um, mine um, is for a uh, best comedian, best female comedy uh, actress. And uh, I would go for Jean Hagen in Singing in the Rain because she was just overlooked completely. And then her Mm. career just didn't really happen very much. Um, She went into a soap opera and she just wasn't, she didn't seem to be like a headline actor or anything. She was nominated um, for Singing in the Rain but um, for Best Supporting Actress. But I feel like she should have won because her comedy bits in that are par excellence. She is so good and she really should have won uh, far, more, far more many prizes for it. The best comedy performance in general would be a good thing, wouldn't it? Since the yeah. Academy do seem to have this weird belief that comic acting isn't acting. Yeah, there's a famous <laughs> yeah. Gene Wilder quote, wasn't there? I can't remember it and I'm not going to look it up, but he wasn't happy, <laughs> he wasn't happy about comedy acting being pigeonholed as a lesser form of acting. Boo! And he's true, yeah. There is so much skill involved in comedy acting. Flip an act. Mm. And it's yeah. Gene Wilder. I mean, come on, the guy is a legend. Mm. Absolute legend. Yeah, absolutely. And it means that it means that comedy actors don't have to do terrible watch me cry films in order to get Oscars, which you know would benefit <coughs> Steve audiences Martin. as well. Steve Martin. Yes. <laughs> what happened to him? He was good, and then he I, wasn't, and then oh, know. you know, he's not. <laughs> I know him and um, Robin Williams were both like really good comedy actors, and then they did when they did like uh, roles that were a bit more moving and emotional. They they uh, sometimes uh, encroached onto that sort of mawkish territory. Yeah, I think Robin thinking, Williams yeah. got away Patch with it. Adams, yeah. Patch Adams. Robin I mean, Williams. Patch yeah. Adams. Yeah, Robin Williams got away with it as much as he didn't get away with it, but <laughs> he was fantastic. He was so funny. Honestly, I've never seen anybody with such a massive gag rate, such a great um, turnover of yeah. uh, gags on the back of improv. I mean, the he, he guy cert- was fantastic. He certainly did. He did better at both than Jim Carrey. <laughs> oh God, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So many people don't like him. I have a little liking for him. I know it's not right. <laughs> yeah, it's not. It's not right. Oh, oh. No, it's not right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Yeah, let's. Uh, mine is, I guess, not so much a new category as an overall of an existing category. Um, but you know, I forget what it's called now. They changed the name this year. But basically, best foreign language film, right? Nice. Do that, but actually award the best foreign language film. Because at the moment, it is, I mean, it, it's got away with it for a bit because it's been awarding things like Parasite and Roma and, you know, Fair Play. Mm. But the setup of Best Foreign Language Film is the most idiotic thing in the Oscars. Because nobody who votes on the Oscars can watch a film on their own bat, uh, they have to rely on the government of each country to find one film that they thought was excellent and really? submit it for consideration. Yeah, which is, I mean, it's stupid at the best of times, but it's causing particular trouble now because 
the best Brazilian film of last year, indeed one of the best films in the world last year, was Baccarat. But I don't think Bolsonaro's government really wanted to push that <laughs> one for some reason. Right. Because it's, it's so... Tell it, give me it, a little synopsis of that. Well, the short version is really not supportive of the government. <laughs> yes! <laughs> I mean, that's what it sounds like, to be fair. <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah. it's kind of racist as a conceit, isn't it? You know, yeah. Like, yeah, it suggests but... that well, like films that aren't in English are somehow lesser and they can be kept in the corner away from all of these English films. And every other body which oh, like makes lists of best films of the year, from the New York Critics Circle to the Golden Globes to well, us, uh, we actually watch foreign films and make our own mind up about which are the best ones rather than waiting for Emmanuel Macron to decide on one particular French film that his cabinet can agree is good, which is the dumbest way to do anything. Here's something that will blow your mind. Hollywood cinema is world cinema to us. It's true, isn't it? World cinema. I think it was a Paul Chowdhury gag. I thought that's amazing. I like that gag, Paul Chowdhury. (laughs) I'm having that. Nice one. Well, speaking of world cinema, uh, should we take a trip to Sweden? Always. Yes. Yeah. Um, Back to the 1920s, it will have been. Um, 1921, 100 years old next year. Oh, wow. We should have held off on that and... (laughs) Yes, but still, it's amazing to think that we're getting to the point in cinema now where films can be over a hundred years old. So, absolutely, isn't that insane? This one, though, *The Phantom Carriage*, is kind of iconic, I guess, Mm -hmm. in horror circles, really, because it's one of these films that's not held up as sort of as its depiction of of death as a character. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but what it is, um. How can I describe this? It's sort of like a morality tale. Like, Mm. it's in essence a Faustian bargain sort of movie in which Mm, a character called David, he's not a good one. He's a pretty... Oh, he's a bad sort. He's a pretty bad one. Um, He, as the movie opens, he's he's having an argument with some other bums and uh, people who are on the street drinking and there's somebody dying nearby who's demanding to see him. Mm. Somebody mm-hmm. comes out to find him, and the other people who were drinking with him say, "You should just go and see her. Go and see her. She wants to see you when she's dying. Go and see her." And then it escalates yeah. into a fight. They hit him with a glass on the head. He passes out, dies essentially, and then the phantom carriage turns up and it recounts why he's a bad one, really. Wow. Because mm. there, there is this mythology of it, which. I don't know if this is genuine Scandinavian folklore. It has the feel of something real. That whoever dies, like in the... Whoever dies last before New Year takes the role of the Grim Reaper for the next year. Right. And this year it's David. But the year before, it was someone David knew. And so... He uses the process of taking David through his new role as death, collecting the souls for a year mm. to sh- show him the folly of his life. It's sort of a Swedish version of It's a Wonderful Life, which I assume would be called Hey, hey, let's not go crazy here. It's all right at best. <laughs> oh, it's almighty Blake, though. <laughs> it okay. really is. Um, there's, I, mean, I don't know how the Swedish justice just the system works but there's a bit not like this where um david is basically arrested for being drunk and he's mm. taken to his cell he says we've got one more punishment before we let you go he is your brother he murdered someone while drunk we think you should uh take responsibility for that crime and let him go because you're worse so, <laughs> no yes. i can understand that sort of um plot beat as an emotional thing, but no, that's not how the world works, Sweden. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I did wonder if that would play better if it was, you know, set in a more distant time period, kind of like how, I mean, we've got to mention it at some point, uh, The Seventh Seal, Ingmar Bergman's film, mm. which was greatly influenced by this. Uh, as history, that is absolute gibberish. Its version of the Middle Ages is just like clashing things that happened centuries apart together. But you sort of accept it because the further back in time it gets, the more it has that quality of a kind of fable. Well, I think that's the the level that this works best on, really. Yeah. Because um, it's, it's very episodic. It's just recounting mm. points of time. Um, how he's genuinely quite bad. It talks about consumption. Uh, which was much bigger deal then, and oh god, all that stuff with them worrying that they were infected by the virus did make me think this. This is not the escapism I wanted right now. <laughs> it's, it, it's not really aged all that well, but again, it's one of these things. As in it, you're talking about a movie which is one year shy of a hundred. You can't judge it by mm. the values of now because you are missing the point entirely. However, I think. Yeah, I, I don't know about aged badly. I mean, the weirdest thing about it in uh, well, terms well, maybe, of... Just on that point, I think maybe that's the wrong word. Yeah. It's just some people, okay. because something is tinnied now, it's bad. Yeah. And I think that sort of a mindset needs to be sort of moved away from, quite frankly. Yeah, I think that's a fair point. I mean, a lot of it's more eccentric points a lot of things that seem strange just looking back at it i rather enjoyed like it's divided into five on-screen acts which i assume is you know a, a relic of the theater because when i think of five acts i think that's the structure of shakespeare yeah, play shakespeare. and now it's all sort of three act structure in screenwriting um, the last time we saw that was actually in another silent movie because that happens in Pandora's box doesn't it or am oh, I misremembering oh, that well it happens quite often in uh, I think it also happens in a uh, diary of a lost girl as well right right which, which this uh, is very familiar or similar to I should say I didn't like it at all in Pandora's Box. In fairness, I found Pandora's Box a bit annoying in general, but I think it it does work here. And I'm not entirely I'm still not entirely sure why, but I think it's because there are so many delineated zones in the Phantom Carriage. There is life and death, obviously. There are different time periods in it. You know, there are long flashback sequences. So the act breaks work in that, you know, they set you up for watching something that's removed from the rest of the film in some way. It, it, it pays quite well. Mm. Uh, there's a point where after um, he's revealed that maybe you could swap places with your brother, mm. it's got a, oh my God, my life is going down the pan. This is such a bad life path I'm going on. I'm going to mend my ways. I'm totally going to mend my ways. He goes home mm-hmm. to reveal, to find out that his wife has left him with his children and then he swears to get vengeance. Nice act break. Very clean. Yeah. Sets, sets it up so, like, I don't know, if it was in a theatre, you could go for a toilet break, get a drink. Very nicely constructed like that. Yeah. A thing that I found particularly in, interesting, um, my experience with... Silent cinema. There's a few Russian things I've seen, but mostly it's German. Mm, yeah, and it's because they were way ahead of everyone else at that point. Oh, yes, yeah. they were basically inventing cinema in those early years. Yeah, but this very much feels like that in the sense of it's inventing effectively what would become sort of like melodrama. I imagine there's other things I've mm. done it before. My my history of silence cinema isn't that strong. It's strong enough, but not that strong. But it's that feeling when you watch movies like this, where you think maybe it's a little bit mm. crude, maybe it could have been done better, maybe it's a little bit heavy-handed. But at the same time, chances are this is the first time something like this was ever literally done. Well, yeah. I mean, there is one particular area in which I found out that's true, because this is uh, based on a novel by Selma Lagerlöf, a Swedish author who 
went down in history as, uh, I believe, the first woman from any country to win the Nobel Prize for Literature. Oh, wow. And she had a contract with the studio who made it to produce an adaptation of her work every year. And despite having this contract, she initially refused to hand them over the rights to the Phantom Carriage because she said it technically, just technically, it could not be made. Which brings you to what I think is the most striking and famous thing about it and something that I think does really hold up which is the special effects used to create the titular phantom carriage, which are incredible. Yeah. It's um, like cut out, really, a lot of it, isn't it? Mm. Uh, as is well like as using, like, la- is it like the poster? Layers. It's like, it's not uh, done using silhouettes. It's done using a technique which is obviously completely familiar now, which is just a very faintly superimpose the actors and the carriage on the rest of the scene so they appear transparent like a ghost. And it's very simple, but it's very, very precisely done in this. It's You never get the sense that you can see the edges of the illusion. Yeah, and there's a way you can do this where it's like maybe one thing here, one thing there. But mm. the way they've superimposed so many things on top of each other yeah, if in some of them are uh, convoluted and um, imaginative scenes, it makes me think of certain points of Ray Harryhausen, where yeah. I don't know how they're meshed scene A with scene B. It seems too complicated to even fathom. Even now, you know, yeah, modern audiences seem to have this idea that we all know how movies are made. Therefore, they have to really go the way to surprise us. But when mm. you see something which it genuinely bemuses you. And in my case, it's whether it's cinematography or something else. But when something genuinely just... You don't know how it was done. It feels like magic trick. And I yeah. don't think there's... That sort of sensation's kind of been rubbed away in the uh, century since this was made. Like more and more as time passed. Yeah, I think because when you watch something like this, or like Harry Towers, and as you say you want to ask, well, how did they do that? And the answer now is they did it on a computer, which I'm sure it takes a lot of work and a lot of skill, but as an answer, it doesn't fire up the imagination when the answer to absolutely everything is, well, I did it on a computer. <laughs> this, there is a level of craft that is maybe, I don't want to say greater than computer animation. I don't think that's necessarily true. It's more tactile, you, isn't it? So Yeah. You understand how precise it is, I think, looking at it. I'm and looking the actual... at the poster, it, it seems... I've not seen the film, but I'm looking at the poster and it looks like it's. Um, it has something in common with German Expressionism of the oh, period. Yeah. Do you yeah, think totally. that's the mm-hmm. case? Um, it somewhere did to... keep reminding me of Nosferatu a lot. I yes. was thinking of Faust and Dr Caligari, I'll be honest. Mm. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's very expressionist. If you don't know what German expressionism is, I mean, frankly, you've a bit late listening to this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it's it, yeah, it, it's been around a while, but we'll go through it anyway. But uh, it's German with lots of filmmakers like uh, Robert Weiner, uh, F. W. Murnau, um, Fritz Lang. Yeah, yeah, it uses the gap between dark and light to create very gothic. Um, images mm. in what they do, and also tells a lot of gothic fairy tales, which this very much is. This is gothic fairy tale one or one, really. I think it's like um, the Grimm brothers really could have wrote something like this, even though it's not the case. It's, it does have yeah. that essence about it. Mm. Uh, one thing that you have to mention when you're talking about silent films is that over the years they most of them have been available in a lot of different cuts with different scores and tints and other things. The version I watched had some of the best colour tinting I've ever seen in that it is used really carefully to delineate different areas Mm. of which scenes are flashbacks, which scenes are set at night, which are during the day, which are dream sequences. It also had this score, which I looked up, it was made... 
I wondered whether it was done at the, ta- the time because it seemed so fitting, but no, it was done in 1998 by the Swedish musician Matty Bai. The, the Matty Bai score might just be the best damn film score that's ever been produced, ever, by anyone. What? Holy monkeys, that's a big claim. <laughs> it is absolutely stunning. Are um, talking about yeah. cappuccino monkeys? It's... <laughs> it just evokes so much, I think. it. I mean, a, a score can kill or make a movie, but this... Mm. It just puts you there. It absolutely puts you there, and there's a sort of a sensation and the mood of the characters. It gets everything right. I mean, I've talked about it before. Uh, music as characterisation. Yeah. I've never seen it in a silent movie before. This has to be the first time. Yeah, it's an absolutely beautiful, sympathetic piece, and I think... Sometimes with silent movies being rescored, you have this problem where people either make a really like jarringly modern soundtrack as a kind of statement, or people go to great pains to produce something that is exactly as it would have been back then, and which can obviously sound quite dated. Yeah. And the Matty Bai score has the best of both worlds. It has these beautiful kind of folk-style melodies which do hark back to the kind of folklore that it's drawing from, but also some really unnerving, atonal, very modernist stuff that brings yeah. it right up to date. I can't praise it highly enough, really. There's a, whenever the carriage appears, I mean, it has like a, a point where the carriage appears and it'll go away to depict like an episode of David's life. But whenever you see the carriage, the only way I can describe it is it feels like uh, the composer was dragging the bow yes. uh, along like a cello or, or something. Because it's such just an atonal racket, but it's perfect. Absolutely perfect. Yeah. So I get that sense of you have to be af- afraid of this thing. This is something you should dread, you know. Yeah. It's so great. Um, one last thing that I have to mention uh, before we move on. I knew going in that this had been a big influence on Ingmar Bergman. What I was not expecting is that it also seems to have been quite a big influence on Stanley Kubrick. Really? Did you see this bit, Rob? Um, I don't recall it, no. Do breaks down an axe with breaks down a door with an axe and looks oh, through the hole. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just it's, seen it this yeah, afternoon, it's all... so it's <laughs> not quite processed it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, literally got the he is Johnny scene from The Shining in there. Except he, well, I was going to say he doesn't say he is Johnny, but it's silent. Maybe he does. Who knows? He is Davy. He is. <laughs> All right, it's he Dave. It doesn't have the intonance. It doesn't have the like a resonance, does it? He uh, is Davy. <laughs> it's it's right. to present a coming. I know that's what it, I know that's what it came from. He is Johnny. You know, like uh, I think Johnny Carson, wasn't it? But, yeah, although, um, you know, everyone in Britain just knows it as that thing from The Shining, which is hilarious. It's like, it sounds like somebody's coming down for, like, a 1990s uh, quiz show. Here's Davy. <laughs> <laughs> they introduce the contestants from... Come on down. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's, it, this is remarkably good, and I was sold it by the horror uh, audience, really, as it being sort of... Um, a horror classic, and I don't think that's true. Mm. I think it's a classic fairy tale. I think it's got that element, yeah, but there is so much more to it. It's it's more Faust than Nosferatu, I think. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I can go with that, yeah. And it's really rather remarkable, I think, yeah. So, uh, that's our director's lottery, where we pick out a particular director from a random number generator and decide on a film of theirs that we want to see. And we'll probably be doing another one in a couple of weeks' time, but, for then, uh, shall we pick out who our next director is? I have the list Ooh. of directors. It goes up to 278. Aye, 278. Do the first one just to get the number out of the way, so it's not biased. Okay. And the second one is 23. 23. Wes Craven. Ah, oh, hmm. wow. 
Interesting. There's a lot of stuff you can do for West Craven, because, I mean, obviously there's, you know, the big hitters, the Nightmare on Elm Street and the Screams, but he had long periods kind of in the wilderness where he produced some stuff like People Under the Stairs, Serpent and the Rainbow, that actually his fans really rate. So I think, um, I think yeah, People Under the Stairs would be a, a great call. Frankly, that would be good. Yeah, yeah. Have I yeah. Seen, I'm trying to remember if I've seen the serpent and, and the rainbow. I've got, I've got it in my head that I have, but I can't quite remember it. it oh, here we go. Bill Pullman. Yeah, I think so. Uh -huh. Yes, yes. Every man. Where he's in Haiti and he has to do with uh, voodoo practitioners, and he has a dream where he's in like caskets quite a lot. You remember oh, it if you see it. It's seen very it. memorable. It's very memorable. Okay, yeah. I think I might have seen it. That might be the only Wes Craven film we've done on the show previously. Yeah, I, I've done I'll have that, to yeah. have a check of the list. Yeah, we but, could swing uh, big and go for Nightmare on Elm Street, but you could. <laughs> you could swing unpleasant and go for Last House on the Left. Oh no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Also, re uh, that's isn't that the one where it's a remake of Virgin Spring? Or am I getting my? Oh yeah, it's still got the Berkman connection going. The other thing about uh, Last House on the Left is that it's really bad. I think <laughs> Virgin Spring isn't Virgin Spring is genuinely miraculous. But there you go. <laughs> that's where the the connection ends. <laughs> <laughs> Perplexed by the pompous, ponderous piffle purveyed by normal art critics? Well, you've come to the right place, because we're not normal. We take a not-so-serious look at the serious worlds of art and literature. Join Sarah, Andrew, Rob and Graham for a piffle-free journey through the cultural landscape of the 21st century. Literary loitering. Because you can't make a cultural omelette without smashing a few eggheads. Hello, nerds. My name's Tracy Long, and you're listening to The Geek Show. And I'm going to get your lunch money. I'm, I'm not. I really am not. I'm, I'm not a bully. I'm, I'm, if anything, I mean, I'm probably worse than you, at least. Anyway, oh, forget, I've ruined it. <laughs> hey, Rod. Yeah? Rod. Yeah? Rod. Oh, is this one of these things where I'm actually calling someone and saying Rob, but it's actually an answering machine? <laughs> no, I just want you to give me some money. <laughs> uh, the best way to do that, listeners, would be via our Patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash the geek show, uh, where we are looking to put exclusive episodes up very soon. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. That sounds like a bargain, uh, is it? I, I would say it's going to be for a knockdown price. I haven't decided what yet we're going to knock down uh, because I've also been busy running our social media presence. Uh, if you want to follow us on uh, Twitter or Facebook or follow Rob on Instagram, then uh, we are at TGS underscore The Geek Show. And if you just want to do something nice and low effort that doesn't actually cost you anything, the simplest and, well, not best thing, the best thing is obviously the money. Uh, but we would also greatly appreciate it if you dropped us a review on iTunes or whatever your podcast yes. provider of choice is. I, I go with Podcast Addict now, so you don't need All to right. be on an Apple-specific device. You can, you got no excuse. Install Podcast Addict, give all of our things five stars, and then give yourself a ridiculous username so we've got no choice but to read it out on the show. Like, um... <laughs> <laughs> I, that, that technique's worked for me, and it's really funny when they read out a user review from Lucio Fulci Salty Mum. So. Yes! <laughs> yeah, we are nothing if not the most bar of podcasts. You just ring up with a stupid name and we'll read it out. Yes. Also, if you give us money on Patreon, we will dance for you. Wow, that this no, that's a level of promise that I can't co sign. <laughs> if you go to thegeekshow.co.uk, you can find our exclusive written reviews about things that we won't necessarily be covering on the show. For example, Ewan has just done one for George Slusier's classic Euro chiller, The Vanishing. And I have just done one for Criterion's collection of Martin Scorsese shorts, which is out, da-dum, 
today. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Good setup, I thought. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Also, with the website, if you go to thegeekshow.co.uk, we're currently giving the website a big old bit of spit and polish. So, very very soon, the whole website will look nice and nice and nice. Spiffy. Mm. So okay. look forward to that. So mm-hmm. yeah. You've taken the pledge to it. <laughs> yes. The Mr. Sheen. <laughs> uh, which my preferred brand of Mr. Sheen would be Michael. <laughs> Agreed. Oh, I fell for that. I, fell, I thought you were giving it genuine consumer advice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, polish tips have been an area we've scandalously neglected here from <laughs> Cinema Eclectica. Exactly. Preferring instead <laughs> the, the easy route of reviewing movies, uh, which we will now do. Uh, Sarah, do you want to kick us off? Because I understand you've recently watched everything. Hmm. Uh, yes, uh, I have watched uh, everything in the world. Uh, <laughs> so what, what shall I start with? What do you think? Shall we kick off? Uh, not to make it too Criterion heavy, shall we kick off with a foreign affair? Yes, that's a good one to kick off with. Um, okay, so a foreign affair is from 1948, post-war, and you know mm. it right from the get-go. Um, it's Billy Wilder, mm. Mm. and uh, one of the, the opening scene is people on the aircraft, and they are looking down on the bombed-out city of Berlin, and it's just unbelievable the devastation streets i mean things that used to be streets like bombed out rows and rows of all these like charred houses fallen down and loads of bricks and yet people still have to live amongst this and uh, do their best to find food and to barter provisions and to sell off their stuff to earn tiny amounts of money Uh, it's very much a buyer's market um, so the odds are very much stacked against the people from Berlin. So into this um, atmosphere is dropped um, Jean Arthur, who plays Phoebe Frost, who is a, a U.S. senator. And it, it's a very weird thing because she it's, it's almost like a theatrical comedy role um, because she's very much like she looks very closed and uptight and um, mm. like f- a frosty kind of woman, as her name would imply. And um, she lands and she has to uh, do a study of how the uh, troops on the ground are helping the people of helping the people of Berlin um, to acclimatize to the fact that <laughs> they've just lost the war horrendously and um, they're incredibly, incredibly poor, having massive hardship, um, and what America is doing about this. Um, she uh, inspects the troops, and one of the people that she meets is uh, Captain John Pringle, who is played by John Lund, who I don't know at all. I mean, I don't know whether... I've never seen him in anything before or since. Um mm. And he's got like the hat at a jaunty angle and he's got a rakish moustache and he's got a wink for the local (laughs) ladies. Um, And he has an ongoing uh, on-off relationship with a local shared 2Z um, called, um, I forgot her name, what's her name? Um, Erica von Schlotov. Wow! Yes, I'm not exaggerating. (laughs) Played by Marlena Dietrich. Everybody, 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 everybody. And uh, Marlene Dietrich is this absolute stunning icon. She's you cannot take your eyes off her. In fact, I remember when I reviewed the the, the Blue Angel, the Blue Angel, yeah. and it's the same thing. You just are absolutely transfixed by this icon. I don't know what it is. You just eyes are pulled towards it and um, pull towards her. And um, she is somehow managing to hold down a job as a. Um, as a showgirl, well, she's not a showgirl. She's like, she's a one-off singer and she entrances the audience and she wears these gorgeous costumes. And uh, and yet, when you go back to her flat, it's in this bombed-out building and it's a first-floor floor flat. 
a first floor apartment and it's apart from all the buildings around it because they're all collapsed and it may have started off on a previous floor i can't be sure um there's mm. walls that are barely there there's holes you know in in internal walls um and somehow she's holding it together in her job um and uh john lund well captain john pringle is very much kind of taking advantage of her but and she's also having to cope with this situation and not be prosecuted um for her relationship with a for uh, with a nazi um uh, one of the high command of the nazis um and mm. so the weird thing about this film is it's like a a, a kind of it's it's on one on the one hand it's got this comedy element of the Phoebe Frost, um, almost stereotypical old maid type person who falls for the you know um, suave captain, and then the extremely mm. real bombed out Berlin and they make for an uneasy bedfellows. It's not an easy watch when you see those two things clashing. Mm-hmm. I mean, can you imagine trying to survive bombed out post-war Berlin as an unmarried female club singer? Just to get food would be incredibly difficult. Um, yeah. So, I mean, obviously things come to a head. You know that Phoebe Frost, the way she presents herself as this big, uh, well, not this big, but this uh, very strongly identified old maid character, you know that she's going to go on that journey of defrosting. Um, and mm. that sort of works out in her favour ultimately, and it's um, and I, well, I won't give away the ending, but um, uh, things come to um, a completely expected uh, uh, crescendo, I suppose, and denouement, denouement, quite so, and <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it's I think the the bigger question is instead of like looking at this oh this is a, a light comedy or it's an amusing oh what's he going to do because the captain is a little bit on the black market and he has his deals here and he has his women here and he's a little, little, little bit rare a little bit rare and <laughs> <laughs> and then on the other hand you can just see the absolute devastation of the area and people living hand to mouth and uh, just having an incredibly hard time, so it's an it's an uneasy mix, but a, a compelling watch, I think. Um, that is a foreign affair by Billy Wilder, nineteen forty eight, which is released now. Yeah, I've watched so many movies since I started doing this in the geek show. There's one that I can't mm. remember the name of. I think it might be Graham Green adaptation. Mm. But there's a noir in which it, it t- takes place in the same sort of um area it's in post-war berlin and there was this one area where the lead character lived and it was like mm. this just area where houses used to be they were all blommed out they were all flattened it was just one house on its own isolated I thought, as yeah. far as periods in history being depicted in cinema i've never seen anything as singular as this it's really yeah. quite something you know you it's don't see anything stark. like that you, know, yeah. you can't recreate it and have the same mm. sort of reality to it I mean, I think... it's so bizarre to see something that was a built-up area and then it's just crumbled and it the expanse of sky becomes larger. It's an unusual thing to see and people sort of mm. trying to trying desperately to scrabble for some money to, to buy the tiniest. I think on at one point they say, oh, I borrowed an onion from XYZ. Do you know what I mean? I borrowed an onion. Yeah. It's it's at that level. Uh, it's astonishing, like what they had to, you know, go through. Yeah. Borrow, presumably, they had to pay back that onion, but you know, at what interest rate? Yeah, an, an onion doesn't come for free. No. That was a Marvin Gaye's follow-up to "The World Is a Great Big Onion." It wasn't quite as big a hit. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think me lowering the tone there is kind of very typical for what I have to do right now. Um, <laughs> if, you've, if you're familiar with movies, which you're listening to this, so you are, you'll know these three words come with an awful lot of baggage. Turkish Star Wars. 
don't feel like yes. I feel the need to say anything more to expand. And that's not what I'm doing. It's just the context of what I'm talking about here. <laughs> yeah. And that movie is the new one from Arrow Films um, called White Fire or Vivre Pour Survivre. Survivre? It's French. I don't know how to pronounce live, things. Live to live yourself. It's by John Marie Pallady, who is the was the director of Softcore Porn, who is the, <laughs> the helm of movies like The Erotic Diary of a Lumberjack. <laughs> what? Um, what? Thailanders, which was renamed something less horrible from an erotic journal of a lady from Thailand, and her porno western saga, I'm guessing it is, called Porno oh, West. God. That's a, just the title alone is lame. God, <laughs> did they spend like more than three seconds thinking of that? Did that the first one you mentioned? What was it again? Erotic Diary of a Lumberjack. <laughs> did it star Michael Palin? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, this stars Robert Ginty, who's probably best known in horror circles for Exterminator, mm. and his sister, played by um, Belinda Main who, in the opening scene, are running away in the in a forest for some reason. Um, <laughs> she and, high heels on, though. That is uh, the no, law. She, uh, she's very young at the time. She's a child. And they have guns, Aww. but nothing comes out the guns. It's basically a scene equivalent of them going pew, 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 pew in the middle of a forest. <laughs> and you can tell the sound effects have been put in and paused. It it sounds very bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, to which we jump 20 years in the future. Uh, and Bo's sister, uh, Ingrid, mm-hmm. works in a diamond mine. And this is a diamond mine where the boss of it, ha- well, he has the worst bright red jumpsuit and cowboy boot combo I think I might have ever seen. And, and oh, really, oh every <laughs> every red jumpsuit and cowboy boots combo is bad, so the composition is for <laughs> yes. <laughs> What's that? Yes, it is. What's that cartoon character? Is it Yosemite Sam that actually has that outfit? <laughs> but in this With base... With his undercrackers and cowboy boots. In this base, right, you got to get into it. You go into the building. You've got a lift that's made out of foil, or an elevator for you uh, international <laughs> listeners. Uh, and you go through this thing and guess it scans something but it looks like it was made via Blue Peter which I guess I don't know what the foreign equivalent of that would be it's basically a kids TV show where they make teach it, uh, make things out of like cardboard boxes and cereal cases, yeah you can you know. make yes. Barbie furniture or you know uh, Tracy uh, Christmas, Island Tracy Island yeah if you can remember that or uh, a Christmas decoration thing or yeah so this is impossible to review, so I'm just going to talk about things that are in it, right? This is this is a repeat of my <laughs> review of Dracula 3D all over again, but this doesn't get a lot of height. Oh, no. <laughs> so, there's a plot in it with an Italian woman who wants to steal stuff that I don't quite understand. And she has an army of Turkish security guards. She's got, like, normal security guards, and she's got the security guards of the moustaches, and oh my word, if you like moustaches, you're in hog heaven with this movie, believe me. <laughs> There's one guy who I didn't know where the man ended and the moustache began. It was like, fuck. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you are a king among men. <laughs> so that's one plot avenue, right? I mean, I wonder if she went to, like, the, the, the get people for your secret military shop and said, I want some guys, but they have to have moustaches. If there's like <laughs> some sort of distinction they got to make there. Just like a village people surplus shop. Yes. <laughs> so there's that aspect of it, right? And there's uh, Bo and there's Ingrid, who steal gems to escape from something that they never really quite explain. They just need to get away from where they are, and they need gem, uh, diamonds to do it. Okay. Thing is, brother and sister, oh. Bo totally wants to sleep with his sister. No. There's a scene yeah. where Ingrid gets out of the shower and he says, Oh, if you weren't my sister, 
<laughs> and oh, what happens, right? I've got to spoil this. I really have to spoil this. I'm sorry if you're really waiting for White Fire and I'm upset about me spoiling it. But Ingrid dies, right? And who should he happen upon in um, a bar? But a woman playing this, the same actress who played Ingrid is now a <laughs> prostitute called Olga. And she looks a little bit different, but, you know, what would really sell this fact is if I took her to a secret plastic surgeon and made her look more like my sister, which happens. It really happens. Um, another plot thread is Fred Williamson turns up looking for his prostitute. <laughs> is anyone seen that? I'm shoot sure my left of all the here. <laughs> and he's got an army of moustache guys too. <laughs> and uh, what's the other plot thread? I think, uh, well, I can't remember the name, but there's a, it all builds to this plot with a diamond called the White Fire, which has got a lot of uh, radioactive energy coming off it. And yeah, it's that. It's got a, it's got a chainsaw fight for no reason. Um, <laughs> right. It's got music by uh, somebody who was involved in Deep Purple. But it's like they could afford one song, and think, right, we're not going to just use it once. That's not very money efficient. We're going to use it as much as we physically can. So whatever the situation, no matter how relevant it is, play the song. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think explains why the lyrics are so meaningless and vague. It's not like the song was badly written or anything, and it's not like a bad song. Oh no, totally, it's a great song. Yes, totally a great song. <laughs> I am not lying at all. <laughs> lying, it's really bad. <laughs> <laughs> Rob Rob shared us uh, this with us in the chat before we recorded, and I, I've got to say, I think it's a banger. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Give it, give a guest verse from Nicki Minaj, and you could have that in the charts today, and <laughs> it wouldn't stand out at all. Oh wow! Um, it's really badly edited. You know, when one scene ends and another one begins. Yeah, I've never quite got as much whiplash as I have with those <laughs> simple edits as I have in White Fire. <laughs> but me seeing all this and me be completely baffled. I'm obviously going to say it's my favourite new thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's totally unreviewable it's a Turkish action movie and there's a reason why these things have an awful re reception because they're basically made for 50 quid and they're ripping off everything absolutely everything but in the case of this one you have to just respect it's just trying some stuff I mean some of it is totally tone deaf I mean the incest what were they thinking with the incest Oh. Yes, I've never felt like action films could do with more incest in general. It's Holy never crap. crossed my mind. But it's just baffling. <laughs> it really is. It's about as good of a movie as you'd expect from a former porn director turned Turkish action movie director. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, when you put it like that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's got a great direct, uh, well, commentary from uh, Kat Ellinger, who really does put a lot of context from this mm. she does a good commentary but yeah it's if I I mean obviously I made that sound awesome <laughs> <laughs> but if you really want to punish yourself by all means watch it but if you respect your time please please don't and please don't blame it on me please <laughs> not white fire on our own video oh dear right so Strap in, everybody, um, because it's time for Female Trouble by John Waters from 1974, um, the writer, director, producer of this film. And anybody who's like, anybody who's listening who was listening to or watching Channel 4 in the 80s might um, be already sort of on side with the Waters oeuvre if you like um because a lot of his uh, stuff was screened then on the late night channel 4 business um this is a really low budget um film i want to say um <laughs> <laughs> it's dark, you have to if the double check with, after what i've just did you have to be doubly sure to confirm these things. vigilant yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> vigilant. 
and it stars Divine, who obviously uh, an absolute icon in her his lifetime, um, mm. his brief life, brief candle, cruelly snuffed out so young. Um, so <laughs> I can't. I mean, what is the story of this? I suppose the story of this is a um, a girl who played by Divine who um, gets chucked out of home and um, wants to become a star and uh, goes through various sort of CD dives to become a star. Um, she, I mean, for instance, <laughs> she hitchhikes and she gets picked up by a guy in a car and they never appear on the screen at the same time. Can I just say that? Um, and he looks <laughs> suspiciously like, oh, divine. Um, so yes, he picks her up hitchhiking, and <laughs> they go about a hundred yards up the road, and they pull over and like hit a mattress and basically go at it like rabbits, and so that's like what an early scene. Um, so yes, there's lots of visual gags as well. Um, I I I think she has a child quite early on by this guy and it's an actual baby it's a tiny baby and you're thinking whoa shizzle just got real um yes. it's um <laughs> she has to look after this child who is a daughter and um she's not a natural mother and the kids are brat and um it's all very trashy trashy and it sort of plays into the whole john waters um world really of trailer trash and loving the trashy mm. side of things um so there's like sleazy saxify a saxophone um everybody in the cast is really unattractive um there's a, a possible inbreeding going on it's very kitsch <laughs> it's funny in places the acting is appalling um, there's full frontal nudity and actual labia. Sorry, I said that word. I said it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and there's also a Liz Taylor looky likey, so that's good. Um, mm. So, uh, yeah, I mean, he, nobody does trash like John Waters. He really works at drawing that out because if you think about it, I mean, how many of films that we watch on a weekly basis, on a yearly basis, feature those lives not that many it's mainly kind of middle class lives or uh, i suppose it um you know if it's a working class uh, film then it makes a uh, a feature of that but it's not the underclass and i feel like this is the underclass it is an area of poverty degradation i mean i have to you know go with rob on this one there is potential incest going on there um there's a lack <laughs> theme of, week i uh, know theme of the week uh, and moustaches. <laughs> there is, a, there is some uh, fine hairdos in this. There's a, there's a section in the hair salon, and you do get some very impressive facial hair going on there. Um, so there is like loads of uh, deprivation, degradation, and anybody anybody listening who's from a town or a part of the country that is deprived in any of the five main criteria for deprivation so that would be like for instance education um poverty uh employment opportunities um health concerns um and uh, uh, all of that is depicted in in this john waters and it's kind of done in a kind of kitsch brightly coloured, shiny, sparkly way. Um, it's, mm. It is compelling. You, It's very difficult to take your eyes away from the screen. And the weird thing is, though, the plot is second to none. The release that you never get any kind of a release from the tension of what it what what it's like living through that story and what their lives must be like. Um, it's it does feature incest it also and another trigger warning mass shooting in a movie theater of course um, yeah um divine, well, he, skirt, he skirts around that later in his career as well didn't he uh that's uh, in you think if cecil cecil be demented yeah, that, that yeah. appears again there yeah yeah 
Um, there are interesting quotes, like uh, probably my favourite would be, eyeliner taken internally heightens one's beauty awareness. <laughs> <laughs> Only John Waters. Only John Waters. Yes. And how could they not love dying if it's for art? Which very reminds me of Sunset Boulevard. There's, Which again, very... Cecil B. Demented. That seems to be a theme mm. in his career. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, there's, I mean, if you remember Lee Bowery from the 80s, there's elements of that there. Um, it's a. Mm. I feel like the, his his body of work has uh, gets uh, has sort of spilled its influence um, as the years have rolled out, um, and and you can see his stuff in in any kind of pop art, trashy art, found art, um, and uh, people like Lee Barry in the eighties, and um, it's so iconic and I don't know anybody else who I don't know of anybody who would feature that kind of lifestyle well, that's kind of his thing isn't it, he wants to represent yeah. the downtrodden yeah. basically spot on I think the nearest other person I can think of is Harmony Corinne and Harmony Corinne is kind of a different proposition uh, yeah. less funny yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, it um, is funny even though it's awful <laughs> and it is he's an absolute sweetheart awful. as well He's just the biggest sweetheart. He Not how many careers. He's very he nicely, is. yeah. Um, so Divine feared being typecast, apparently, and this was her favourite film, as she played a straight male character as well. And <laughs> did you know, fun fact of the day, Divine auditioned for a male role in Ridley Scott's Blade Runner. Wow. Really? That's a I fact know. of the day there. That's a it good is. one. Yeah. <laughs> So that is Female Trouble, 1974. John Waters, available now. I have before me uh, a copy of the VHS cover for Female Trouble <laughs> when it was released by Palace Pictures in the 1980s. Oh, wow. Yeah, Palace Pictures. Blast from the past, I know. Yep. Uh, in fact, it's not even the VHS cover, it's the Betamax cover. Oh, That's how far this is going what? back. Uh, but here are some quotes from the back. Uh, another outrageous exercise in poor taste. <laughs> the more perverse divine acts, the more the stoned audience cheers. <laughs> and my favourite from Rex Reed. Where do these people come from? Where do they go when the sun goes down? Isn't there a law or something? They're not werewolves. <laughs> <laughs> Bloody hell. So yes, uh, that's been your lot from Cinema Eclectica. Next week we are coming back with another streaming special because there's been a lot of streaming stuff, obviously, mm. for clear reasons. Mm. Uh I will be contributing a release of Werner Herzog's new film, Family Romance LLC, which he has been promoting in a very uncharacteristic way, largely by smiling. Steady on. He's been doing a lot of smiling recently. It weirds me out. I think he said something recently, Werner Herzog, where he's got the most bizarre fan base that he never saw coming. I think it was like teenagers. Uh, just. Oh, Yes really major fans of him yeah he says they all write to him about the enigma of Casper Hauser which I think is just the, the cherry on the top that it's that film for some reason that's bizarre Yeah, he's a bizarre human being as Werner Herzog does there can never be mm. another strangeness follows him around <laughs> But yes, uh, that's what we'll be doing next week. But until then, that's been your lot from Simba Eclectica. I've been great. I've been Sarah. And I'm not watching any movies anymore by ex porn directors. But otherwise, <laughs> I've been Rob. <laughs> you, you could have finished that as I'm not watching any movies anymore. And to be honest, we'd have understood. Yeah, but I'd be missing out on foil elevators and nobody can cut that out of their life. <laughs> <laughs> See you next week. <laughs>